welcome everybody to the first lecture of the lecture series on, uh, on the arts by the Doon School Old Boys Society. We have felt that for a long time this is a space that the Doon School occupies but does not occupy. We find that we are unable to reach out many times to our spouses because we have wonderful dinners and we have wonderful sporting events and then they feel a little left out because we tend to congregate. So it's a two-pronged effort on our behalf that one, to, uh, to reach out to Doscos that perhaps are not sports people and have a slightly more cerebral interest in life and also we want to reach out across fraternities so we have doon school boys here we have people from mayo from sanar from wellam girls school we have girls from wellam from boys from wellam we have sindhya we have daily college um, it is absolutely fantastic to see the wonderful turnout we've had and thank you all for responding so warmly and coming out this evening. Um, since this is, since this is a, a lecture series that we're going to do on the arts, I thought it was, would be best kicked off by Mr. Arun Bharatram, who is himself a patron of the arts. His family has patronized the arts. And so without further ado, Arun, would you? A few words. <laughs> Thank you, Rahul, for the kind introduction. And uh, I promise you it's going to be just a few words because we really want to hear Sumanjit. And uh, let me say, just coincidentally, the last time I met Sumanjit was in Amsterdam, outside the Van Gogh Museum where my son, daughter-in-law, and their two children, we were trying desperately to get into the museum. And so Manjit said, if you haven't booked tickets in advance, there's no chance of you going in there. So we were highly disappointed. And we saw some of the paintings in the uh, uh, other museums. The Rick, Rick, what's it called? The Rick, uh, Rikes, 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 yeah. Some of uh, Van Gogh's paintings there. Uh, since um, Rahul wanted me to speak a little bit about uh, um, broadening our horizons uh, from the kind of activities we do, and this applies, uh, by the way, not just to DOSCOs, but to all, particularly boarding schools, but also day schools, uh, we, are, uh, we have become quite insular in uh, focusing on... Uh, activities which are more uh, uh, sports oriented uh, and we have to some extent neglected uh, the arts, we have neglected uh, culture and uh, so I thought that we should really be as a group of people looking at having the lecture series where we can invite um, speakers who can speak on topics which are interesting, which are, uh, which are topics where perhaps like we don't know that all the, at least I don't, I'm not, I don't want to even pretend I know much about uh, either Van Gogh or about a lot of the paintings that we, I, ha I, have, I have some good paintings, but I am not a qualified um, I'm not qualified to comment on the, the uh, way the paintings have been made and the depth of the paintings, etc. To the eye, they look beautiful, and so that's the limitation that I have as far as painting is concerned. So, ladies and gentlemen, good evening. Vincent van Gogh's life, or van Gogh, as the Americans say, or oh, Van Gogh, as the Dutch say, you kind of clear your throat and say the name at the same time. 
His life has usually been studied through his paintings. Many people have learned about Van Gogh through Irving Stone's famous novel, Lust for Life. But I must tell you that this is a highly fictionalized, romanticized, and not very accurate version of his life. I have studied his life through his letters. Van Gogh was a very lonely person. He was only really close to his brother Theo, who supported him financially throughout his life. Often at night, Vincent sat down and wrote a long letter, sometimes 20 to 30 pages, to his brother, in which he poured his heart out and told him everything about what he felt, what he read, what he was thinking of painting, what he painted, and so on and so forth. And there are 820 letters which were discovered by Johanna Bonger, who was Theo's wife, after Theo died. Theo had apparently just kept them, stuffed them inside. And she released these to the public. And it is these letters that tell us the real story about Vincent van Gogh. Now, these letters often had detailed illustrations and sketches of what Vincent was planning to paint. So if you read his letters, you can actually almost walk through his life as he picks his brush up and translates his thoughts into action. He wrote in Dutch, French, and English, and these letters are available translated on the net, which is how I read them. Vincent was very well read. He was very fond of literature. He read all of Shakespeare, all of Charles Dickens. He read the French classics, Emile Zola, Guy de Maupassant, and he also read a lot of philosophy. And we get a lot of insights into the man as we go through his letters. Vincent was born in 1853 in a small town called Zundert in Holland. His father was a Protestant teacher, preacher. He had two brothers and three sisters. He was a loner, and as a child, he often walked off from school and went off into the woods to go and you know, look at nature because he was really fond of nature. He did not mix easily, and he left school early. Now, his uncles owned one of the largest art dealerships in Europe. It was called Goupil and C, Goupil and Company. And at the age of 16, his uncle got Vincent a job as a trainee in their Hague office. Vincent was the oldest cousin, the uncle had no kids, and he was really the heir apparent to this whole empire. At 19, Vincent got his first rejection from a young lady. This was a girl called Caroline Hanabeek. And Vincent was potty about her, but she just didn't respond. She went and married somebody else. He was heartbroken. And in his letters, he writes for months afterwards about the purity of his love. And this is significant, and I'll tell you why later. Four years later, in June 1873, he transferred to their London office. And there he stayed as a paying guest with the lawyer family. And he developed strong feelings for their 19-year-old daughter, Eugenie. And, of course, fell in love with her and proposed to her. But she did not reciprocate. So this was the second time that he was unlucky in love. Vincent had a very good eye for art. But he was basically a socialist at heart. He did not enjoy the commercial aspects of the job. And so he often offended rich clients with his undiplomatic comments about them if he felt they weren't really interested in art. And Goupil didn't appreciate this. So they transferred him to their Paris office to give him one more chance. And at the age of 23, in April 1875, they said, sorry, buddy, you just don't make the cut. And they asked him to leave. Mm -hmm.